Pulse Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Kurdish people are one of the largest ethnic groups in the world without a country of their own. More than 30 million people spread across Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. They're a minority everywhere they live. But in recent years, Kurds have played a major role in the conflicts in the Middle East. They fought with the U.S. to topple Saddam Hussein in Iraq, where they carved out their own autonomous region. Now Kurdish groups are battling both the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and forces loyal to Bashar al-Assad. Meanwhile, a two-year-old ceasefire between Turkey and rebels from the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, was broken in July. Now Turkey has launched a new military offensive against the PKK in Turkey and Iraq. That comes as the PKK killed 30 Turkish security forces in two bombings in eastern Turkey this week. Today on Global Journalist, a deeper look at the role of the Kurds and the swirling conflicts of the Middle East. Joining us this week from Cookville, Tennessee, Michael Gunter, author of the book The Kurds Ascending, The Evolving Solution to the Kurdish Problem in Iraq and Turkey. He's also a professor of political science at Tennessee Technological University. From Springfield, Missouri, David Romano, a professor of Middle East politics at Missouri State University and author of the book Conflict, Democratization and the Kurds in the Middle East. And from Erbil, the capital of the autonomous Kurdish region of Iraq, journalist Mohammed Saleh. He's reported for news outlets including Al Jazeera, The Guardian, and Al Monitor. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Michael Gunter, tell us if you would, we often hear of the Kurds uh, spoken of as sort of a monolithic group in the Middle East, but there are, of course, a number of different significant groups that have been involved in some of these conflicts now. Can you just give us a little bit of an overview of that? Well, the Kurds are in four major states, Iran, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. So in each state, you have different types of Kurds. And then in each state, the Kurds are divided in that state, too. For example, in Iraq, you have notoriously or maybe famously the Barzani's KDP and Talibani's PUK. In Syria, you have one main group now, the PYD, but it's, there are also other groups in Syria. In Turkey, of course, is the PKK. In Iran, there are two or three smaller groups. And the uh, PYD in Syria is often said to be an affiliate of the PKK in Turkey. So that's a short analysis. So a number of different groups. David Romano, what's been happening in Turkey has been much in the news over the past couple of days. Give us just a brief overview of the situation there right now. Sure. The, the, the main Kurdish group, uh, political group in Turkey uh, started its insurgency in 1984. In 2013, a ceasefire was arrived at between the government and the PKK. And that held for, for some two years uh, as they supposedly negotiated for a, a solution to the conflict. The government wouldn't negotiate directly with the PKK or offer an amnesty, however, and the PKK didn't uh, stop uh, all its activities, it maintained some political activities and so forth. Uh, it didn't withdraw every single one of its fighters from Turkey, and that blew up again uh, in July. Uh, when the government uh, launched uh, massive uh, air bombardments on PKK camps in Iraqi Kurdistan. And, and now it looks uh, like we're back to a full-fledged uh, conflict uh, approaching civil war in the area. And the PKK is seeking uh, a Kurdish state or their own autonomous region, is that correct? They were seeking a Kurdish state until around 1993. Since then, they haven't been uh, claiming that. They've just been asking for uh, greater democratic and minority rights and more uh, self-government uh, in the predominantly Kurdish regions of Turkey. And Mohammed Saleh, you heard David talking about these airstrikes that Turkey has launched against PKK targets uh, within Iraq. Can you tell us just a little bit about the relationship between Iraqi Kurdistan and Turkish Kurds and the Turkish government? It's a very complicated set of relations. Uh, there is generally a broad level of uh, intra-Kurdish empathy when it comes to, uh, to the popular level, let's say. But uh, when it comes to the political parties, uh, there has been historically animosity. There has been cooperation at times. And uh, the situation really hasn't uh, changed in some ways uh, that much. Uh, although, for example, 
the Iraqi Kurds and the uh, PKK, for example, have been cooperating in the war against the Islamic State or ISIS or ISIL. Uh, they also have their own uh, tensions uh, and basically it, 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 each one of the major groups in Iraq and the PKK uh, try to dominate the broader Kurdish uh, political scene. But uh, in terms of the relationship between the Iraqi Kurds or the Kurdistan regional government and the Turkish government, uh, relations have improved dramatically since 2010, 2011, and uh, ba basically things got to a level that, uh, that, that was not even really uh, imaginable just a few years before that. Uh, but now with the Turkish attacks on PKK positions in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, there are basically a lot of voices that are protesting uh, the, the use of force by the Turkish government uh, against PKK and the Kurds inside Turkey and also their cross-border attacks uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. So, correct me if I'm wrong, Mohammed. then, so in Iraqi Kurdistan, the governing authority works with the PKK and its affiliate in Syria in fighting uh, in ISIS there. But it also has a relationship with Turkey, I understand, uh, in terms of transiting oil or selling oil. How has that affected relations? Well, uh, there was recently an attack on, a, on an oil pipeline that basically transferred the oil from Iraqi Kurdistan to the Turkish uh, port of Jehan on the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, the PKK, or at least a statement issued in the name of the PKK, uh, basically attributed the responsibility to the PKK, but later uh, the PKKs uh, have, have, have said that they were not really behind it and that it was a group that uh, acted on its own without uh, basically an order from the, the, the central uh, leadership of the group. Uh, but uh, when we talk about the intra-Kurdish relations between the, the Kurdistan regional government and its uh, major political parties and the PKK or its affiliate in Syria, the PYD, we have to be very mindful that uh, it, it has been an, uh, an uneasy relationship uh, for most of the time. And uh, although there have been and there is still some cooperation in some area, and that is uh, very specifically the fight against ISIS, they, they do not uh, necessarily see eye to eye on a lot of other issues. Michael Gunter, back us up just a bit, if you would. Remind our listeners how U.S. interventions in Iraq have ended up aiding the Kurds and the nature of the U.S. relationship with Kurdish groups. The United States, by beating Saddam Hussein and 1991, and then destroying them in 2003, in effect, birthed the uh, KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government in Iraq. So the United States is <clears throat> directly responsible for the current semi-independent Iraqi Kurdish government in Iraq. And when ISIS attacked the KRG in August last year, and drove within 20 miles of the capital, Erbil, where our friend Mohammed Salil is speaking from today. Uh, Turkey, the new ally of the KRG, did nothing, did not come to the aid. <clears throat> it was the United States air power that basically saved the Kurds. And at that time, <clears throat> the KRG's ground forces, the Peshmerga, and also PKK forces, that are in the mountains of northeastern Iraq, and PYD forces, Syrian Kurdish forces, all provided the boots on the ground, along with American air power, <clears throat> to stop the ISIS drive in northern Iraq. So the United States support has been absolutely crucial for the Iraqi Kurds. However, the United States is against Iraqi Kurdish independence for a variety of reasons, which frustrates the uh, Iraqi Kurds. It also prevents the United States from getting enough weapons of high quality to the Iraqi Kurds because the weapons have to go through Baghdad, which does not want to give too many weapons to the Iraqi Kurds, lest they become independent. And of course, the United States air power supported the Syrian Kurds last year and into June, January of this year when ISIS was 
uh, besieging Kobani. So the United States has played an absolutely crucial role in uh, supporting the uh, Kurds. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week we're talking about the role of the Kurds in the current conflicts in the Middle East. Joining us this week from Cookville, Tennessee, Michael Gunter, a professor of political science at Tennessee Technological University. From Springfield, Missouri, David Romano, a professor of Middle East politics at Missouri State University. And from Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan, freelance journalist Mohammed Saleh. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. David Romano, I wanted to ask you, we just heard Michael Gunter talking about the very close military cooperation between the United States and between Iraqi Kurds, Syrian Kurds, and the PKK, Turkish Kurds, and fighting ISIS, and yet the United States also considers the Turkish group, the PKK, to be a terrorist organization. So explain to us how, how that is. Well, part of it is just a political interest. Uh, these terrorist lists are, that governments draw up are all based on who they like and who they don't like. Uh, many years ago, there was a film that came out on the Kurds called Good Kurds, Bad Kurds. And it just basically said that the Kurds fighting our allies, uh, the PKK, are bad Kurds, and the ones fighting our enemies, the Iraqi Kurds fighting Saddam, are good Kurds. And that was the, the whole explanation. Of course, it, it goes beyond that a little bit. Uh, the, the PKK has a, a Marxist-Leninist uh, past and uh, was... Uh, doing its uh, early training in Lebanon with uh, Palestinian groups and, and had a very uh, anti-American discourse. So, so that worked all into it as well. The PKK has since tried to shed that, and it's also uh, tried to uh, move away from early strategies that it uh, recognized as mistakes, which included targeting uh, civilians, like families of uh, village guards that the Turkish government set up to help fight uh, the, the PKK. Uh, so uh, it's true that the, the American uh, approach towards the PKK, and to some extent the European one, has been uh, to categorize it as a, a terrorist organization and have nothing to do with it. That's slowly changing now with the, the war against ISIS and some uh, apparent uh, changes within the PKK itself. And Mohammed Saleh, you're in Erbil right now. Tell us just a little bit about what life is like there. Do people feel safe? Do they feel secure? Uh, you know, Michael Gunter mentioned that the Islamic State forces had mm -hmm. gotten within 20, 30 miles of Erbil last year. Well, I should say that despite that, uh, life is miraculously like uh, secure here. I mean, if, if you live here, you wouldn't have a problem or uh, any fear to go outside and even, you know, stay up, uh, stay out uh, up until the very uh, late hours of night. So uh, the, in terms of general security, yes, people say, feel safe and secure and uh, uh, the fact that ISIS is very close to Erbil or other major Kurdish cities has not really had any impact in terms of uh, the day-to-day -day life of people, but uh, the, the emergence of ISIS in this part of Iraq has had a quite neg negative impact on the economy of Iraqi Kurdistan. And, uh, that means that uh, a lot of people have been really laid off from work and uh, it is becoming more and more difficult for people to be able to find work with the private sector and also with the public sector because the government has been suffering from a very serious uh, shortage uh, in terms of its revenue and budget. Michael Gunter, tell us if you would about this agreement that the United States struck with Turkey just a couple months ago, in which it was announced that Turkey would join the fight against ISIS in Syria. And this was seen as something as, uh, you know, a really big step forward for the U.S., for those allied against ISIS. What, what has come of that? Okay, if I just briefly mention, I think right now the uh, biggest crisis in the KRG, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, Mohammed just alluded to the financial crisis, and what David Romano was talking about. I, I think the fact that Turkey is a NATO ally of the United States 
explains always why the U.S. comes down on the side of Turkey instead of the Kurds when there's a conflict there. Now, uh, David Romano mentioned a movie uh, some years ago, Good Kurds, Bad Kurds. I'll mention another movie, Wag the Dog. Wag the dog. Uh, why Why did Turkey suddenly uh, get off the fence and supposedly come into the uh, battle against uh, ISIS uh, in July? It's because the Erdogan government in Turkey lost its 10-year majority in the June elections to the pro-Kurdish party that won enough seats to enter parliament, and those seats uh, the pro-Kurdish party won were taken away largely from the ruling AK party. So you don't have a majority government in Turkey right now. And it seems to me that the uh, president of Turkey, uh, Recep Erdogan, calculated that if he could create a crisis with the Kurds, then he could stamp the uh, pro-Kurdish party in parliament as a supporting terrorism, call a snap election, and regain his uh, majority. And that is uh, a, maybe a somewhat simplified version, but I think largely explains why Turkey suddenly entered the fray in July, claiming it was uh, coming in to support the United States against ISIS. And th that is really just an excuse. The Turks have done very little against ISIS and have basically struck against the Kurds. Uh, the PKK, and uh, supposedly have given the United States usage of the Turkish air base in Chirlik, but my goodness, a, a NATO ally should not have negotiated with us for two years to let us use in Chirlik air base against ISIS, but uh, all this is part of the um, uh, menu here. I, one more thing, in, in favor of Turkey, Turkey sees the main enemy in Syria as being Assad, not ISIS. The United States sees the main enemy as being ISIS. So Turkey and the United States have different viewpoints about whom the main enemy is in Syria. Um, well, well, let me Syria. hold you there. David Romano, do you want to pick up on what Michael, yeah, Michael Gunter was saying about Turkey, Prime Minister, or President essentially wagging the dog here with this conflict? I, I do. If the if the Americans uh, made a deal with with Turkey uh, for Turkey to join uh, the, the the fight against ISIS, this was a bum deal. This is this is a disaster. It's a huge setback. Uh, the use of Inchilik Air Base uh, saves the Americans some jet fuel, allows them to keep some planes in the air a bit longer over ISIS targets. But they they had uh, they didn't have enough targets. Uh, to begin with, because they're being careful to avoid civilian casualties in their bombings, it's uh, it's very little at the cost of uh, a lot of damage to the main force on the ground that was fighting ISIS most effectively, which is the the, the PKK aligned uh, groups along with the Iraqi Kurds. And Turkey has done some four or five hundred air sorties against Kurdish targets and a half dozen against ISIS targets, uh, dropping bombs in empty fields. Uh, this is, uh, I, I would have to agree completely that this is an issue of trying to get a rally around the flag effect and uh, trying to redo the June 7th elections so that Erdogan gets the majority he wants so he can get a Putin-style presidency. Uh, and uh, it, it's not only damaging the fight against ISIS, but it's damaging democracy in Turkey. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. This week, we're talking about the multifaceted role of the Kurds in the current conflicts in the Middle East. Joining us are Michael Gunter, author of the book, The Kurds Ascending, The Evolving Solution to the Kurdish Problem in Iraq and Turkey. From Springfield, Missouri, David Romano, author of Conflict, Democratization, and the Kurds in the Middle East. And from Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan, freelance journalist Mohammed Saleh. Mohammed Saleh, I understand that the U.S. and Turkey had spoken of establishing a buffer zone on Turkey's southern border with Syria, a place that would be ISIS-free. What does that look like? Is that something that is feasible? Well, the Turks seem to be quite serious about that, but uh, it appears uh, from what has been reported that the U.S. has not been really uh, looking very favorably upon this uh, plan, at least not so far. And uh, as far as the Kurds are concerned, uh, especially the Kurds in Syria, 
they are very worried about this and they mostly see this as an attempt by the government of Turkey to separate uh, two of the three Kurdish uh, self rule areas in, in northern Syria. So uh, that, that has added uh, to the existing tensions between the Syrian Kurds and, and, and Turkey and uh, has, has basically added to the, to the existing level of uh, mistrust between the two, the, the two parties. And Michael Gunter, you had been speaking about Turkey viewing the Assad regime as their main enemy in Syria and the United States viewing ISIS as their main enemy in Syria. What about for the various Kurdish groups? Who do they, who do they view as their primary enemies? The United States? No, for the various Kurdish groups operating yeah. in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, who do they view as their main enemies? Whom does the United States view as the main enemy? No, who do the Kurdish groups view as their main enemies in Syria? Is it the main Assad, enemy in Syria. ISIS? <laughs> Uh, Turkey. In, in Syria, the main enemy has been ISIS, because ISIS has been attacking the Syrian Kurds. Of course, the Syrian Kurds also think of Turkey as being an enemy, because it's been giving implicit support to ISIS. And, of course, also the Assad regime is seen as an enemy. But... <clears throat> but uh, the, the main immediate enemy of the Syrian Kurds has been ISIS. And David Romano, you can pick up on that if you would. I also yeah. wanted to ask you about relations between President Erdogan. At one time, he was seen as having done some pretty significant outreach towards Kurdish groups, and yet he seems to be reversing course here. Can you explain that? Sure, sure. I, I would add to the to the enemies list of the Syrian Kurds, not just ISIS, but uh, all the jihadi groups, including groups that Turkey is openly supporting, like Jabhat al-Nusra and Ahar al-Shams. Uh, and, and the Syrian Kurds have not fired so much as a bullet or a mortar round at Turkey. Uh, they, they've been working very hard to try to uh, reduce Turkish uh, fears of, of their ascendancy in Syria. But that, that ISIS free zone that Turkey uh, and the U.S. have been talking about establishing is really a Kurdish free zone. ISIS has been there for two years. The sudden urgency to establish a, a safe zone is because of Kurdish advances, not because of ISIS advances. Uh, but Erdogan's... Uh, El the ones, um, uh, could you repeat that question? Actually? Yeah, no, I wanted to ask you. He, at one time, he had been seen as in something, I don't know if you would say an ally, but someone who had made some significant uh -huh. outreach towards Kurds. I understand Kurdish, the Kurdish language wasn't used on television, yeah. on broadcast TV previously in Turkey. That's something that he changed. Sure, uh, that, that's an easy one. Uh, Erdogan and his party uh, did uh, a lot of uh, reforms uh, to uh, improve uh, the, the rights of Kurds to, to use their language or education. It's still quite limited by, by European standards, but it, it was a lot of good improvements for Turkey. The calculus there was that Kurds would vote for his party as a result. Uh, and that's why uh, the party uh, entered into very indirect negotiations with the PKK, which were really just demands on the PKK. No promises to the PKK, no, no amnesty, no release of their leader from prison, no, no, uh, uh, not, not much of anything. But the calculus was to get votes for the AKP. When they stopped getting more Kurdish votes for the AKP, they said, well, what's the point? And uh, they, they shifted to a different strategy, which is conflict. But uh, yes, they did make attempts, but I think it was very uh, Machiavellian, uh, electorally uh, driven attempts, not a sincere uh, desire to uh, uh, end the conflict uh, with the PKK. And Mohammed Saleh, you're in the autonomous region of, Kurdish autonomous region of Iraq. Do Kurds in the area, do they see this as being a moment where uh, there will be able to, they'll be able to form their own state where they'll be able to unify with some of these groups across borders, or is that something that's not seen as feasible right now? Well, the important point is that we have to know that not all the Kurdish groups in the region, in the Middle East, are seeking an, an independent state. So the PKK, for example, as uh, David pointed out at the beginning, they have abandoned uh, their quest for an independent Kurdish state uh, ever since mid-1990s. And uh, the PYD in northern Syria, which is uh, being viewed as an affiliate of the PKK, uh, they have not brought up the issue of wanting an independent state, and uh, they say that they just want 
uh, autonomy or self-rule in northern Syria. It is only the Iraqi Kurds who are actually in a position and do want uh, independence, uh, especially at the popular level. When it comes to the political level, uh, the major Iraqi Kurdish groups are divided. They are not necessarily divided uh, over the objective of achieving independence but they are actually divided uh, over the mechanisms and the timing of it. So uh, the major Iraqi Kurdish party, the KDP, Kurdistan Democratic Party, uh, at least is publicly very much in favor of, uh, of an independent Kurdish state, uh, but uh, the other major groups have not really uh, made, uh, made, of, made an issue of that uh, publicly. They, 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 they have not been very much uh, pushing for this. But uh, if you look at the conditions and if you compare the current conditions with the uh, situation that the Kurds have been in in this region over the past century, uh, this is probably the most promising uh, opportunity that the Kurds uh, have had uh, in, in almost a century to, to be able to establish an independent Kurdish state. Uh, but again, uh, largely due to internal rivalries and uh, the, the, the fact that also they are not uh, very much certain of some of the reactions from the regional countries uh, such as Iran and uh, to a lesser extent Turkey uh, that has helped uh, Iraqi Kurds back from trying to go for outright independence. Michael Gunter, our time runs short. I did want to ask you, though, Turkey is scheduled to have new general elections in November. Obviously, this current conflict with the Kurds is going to be a major issue in that. Where do you see things evolving over the next year? How is the situation going to be different in 2016-2017? Well, the elections are being called by Erdogan because he thinks he can win a new majority because of this crisis he's created. The public opinion polls right now, though, show that Erdogan is not going to win a new majority. So it's up in the air what is going to happen. Uh, and the Middle East is always presenting new problems. So all I can say is that it looks like uh, the civil war in Syria is going to continue, and ISIS is going to continue to be a very definite threat. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, I just read an article earlier this morning that the United States intelligence is cooking the information on ISIS, and that ISIS is a more dangerous organization and more successful than what the U.S. intelligence has been saying that it is. So obviously ISIS is going to continue to be a threat next year. That's going to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Many thanks to Michael Gunter, David Romano, and Mohamed Saleh for joining us. Global Journalist executive producer is Joshua Kranzberg, and our associate producers this week are Javilla Raskaskit and Mikkel Christensen. Our studio director is Travis McMillan from RJI, and our audio engineer is Pat Akers of KBIA. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us.